Okay, good morning, Arata State. Today I want to talk to you about the research process. Let me share my screen with you. Wait a minute. Come on. All right, there we go. So there's six steps to the research process. The first step is to identify what you already know about your family and then decide what you want to know. Then select the records to search, obtain the records, use the information, and repeat the process. So the first step is to collect what you already have around your house, identify what you know, so look for uh, certificates and letters and diaries and old genealogical information, bits of pieces of paper that have things scribbled on them, old photographs, and collect all of this information and go through it. Another important part would be to talk to the oldest living relatives and see what they remember. Don't push them for dates necessarily, but ask them about people that they knew, about their grandparents and their and their parents, maybe they knew their great grandparents even. Get them talking and telling stories and record that information. Record the date, record who you talked to, record the phone number that you used to talk to them or the address where they lived. Uh, collect photographs and try to identify all the people and date the people in the photographs. And once you have collected all of this information, then you need to record it down and save it in a format that will be easy for you. And it used to be that it was all done on paper, but now you can do electronic as well. If you're doing paper format, you can use family group sheets and pedigree charts. If you're doing electronic format, then you can use a desktop uh, program such as um, Find My Past or, uh, not Find My Past, sorry, Legacy, Roots Magic, Family Tree Maker, and some of these programs have a free version and then some of them you would need to purchase that generally, except for Family Tree Maker, I think everybody else is around $30, $35 and not too expensive, hopefully. You can also use online uh, programs in the cloud, such as Family Search and Ancestry, My Heritage, Find My Past. Once you have all your information gathered, then you start recording it in the format that you want to record it in. But remember to record the names as you speak them. So Jonathan Green would be written as Jonathan Green with the normal capitalization that you would use to write names. You don't have to do the last name all in caps anymore. and You don't have to do the last name first. Just write it the way you say them. When you're writing, uh, the women's names use their maiden name, not their married name. And when you're writing dates, write out the date starting with the day. So the 4th of April, 2016. If you use um, one for whatever the date, somebody might think it's January 4th and somebody might think it's April 1st, which would be April's Wolves Day. So anyway, write out the date. If you're using paper format, make sure you enter the information in the correct format. So if somebody comes by after you, they'll understand uh, exactly what you mean. And the way you put information in pedigree chart is put your name or the first person in that first spot. And then their father goes in the spot above and their mother goes in the spot below. And then their father's father in the spot above, father's mother in the spot below mother's father in the spot above the mother, and mother's mother, and you see the pattern. That's the appropriate way to record information on a pedigree chart. And then after you've collected the information that you already have, it's time to figure out what you want to know and decide where you want to start researching. Thoughtfully select the family of greatest interest to you, but it's good practice 
to start from the known working to the unknown. So in other words, research something, have a question about your parents or your grandparents. Don't go to your third great grandfather and try to work forward. There is so much more of a propensity to have error working from the unknown to the known. So work from the known backwards. And so you decide what you wanna know and recognize that you might have to break it down into small pieces. Just like you can't eat an elephant all at once, but you could eat an elephant taking one bite at a time. Our genealogical quest you can break down into small pieces. When you're thinking about your quest, here is a formula for success for you. You need to know, at least know their name and one date and one location. And preferably use someone that was born after 1850 if you're doing US research because that is when you will have the most success and that's when the more records are available. So you might uh, know someone's name and their marriage date and marriage location or death date and death location. Once you've decided on your genealogical quest, then write it down. I've been working on my husband's grandfather's life and I found this information about him in a book and uh, I gleaned as much information as I could out of this book. I saw that uh, he, Anthony Tarullo was a co-owner of a business with John Colosco and the name of the business was Newport Clothing Manufacturing Company in Newport, New Hampshire. They were in business from 1934 until Mr. Tarullo's death in 1946. So I wrote down the information that I discovered and, uh, and I realized, well, I know when he died, but I don't know the exact date and I don't know the location. So that I decided would be my quest. I want to know how, when, and where did Anthony Tarullo die? It's a simple question and I wrote it out so that I can stay focused on it. And my goal is to find a source, to find the answer to a question and then find at least one source that tells me the answer, but preferably two or three sources that collaborate the answer. And the overall goal for us in, in our family history work is to find at least one source for every fact that we have on our family. So I have this information about Anthony uh, from my um, book article. I can record it on a uh, family group sheet or I can record it electronically, but it's important to write down what I know. And then I selected the question and now I'm up to step three and I'm going to select the records that I want to search. So now I'm to my research plan. I'm going to develop this research plan so I'll have a plan to follow and I will stay focused and not go down rabbit holes that we so often do because there's so much online, right? So many fun places to go and, and look. So I start with my research question. I, I just do this on a Word document. I say, um, write my research question out. I like to highlight them so that it's staring at me. It's easy to see. And then record your starting information. So this is the information I'm starting with. I know who his parents are. I know where and when he was born. I know the date he died, but not the location. But I do know a month and a year and a location for burial. I know who his spouse is and who his children are. And so I want to find out death information and the most likely, the record that might give me the most success would be a death record. But I don't know where to look for that death record. And a good rule of thumb, a good rule of thumb for US research is to do census research first. And so I know that Anthony was born in 1909, but he didn't come to the United States until 1912. I actually didn't write that in my starting information. So I'm gonna look for him in 1920, 1930, and 1940 census. And I'm specifically interested in the 1940 because that was six years before he died and 
hopefully that will be a good place to look for his death certificate. And then the next thing on my list is to find the death certificate. So I'm up to step four in my research process. I'm going to try to obtain these records. I'm going to try to look for the 1940 census so then I can find the death certificate. Well, census records are pretty easy to get to. Lots of companies have them. You can locate them in lots of places. I'm going to look for them in Family Search because that's easy and it's free. So I sign into Family Search. Hopefully, you ha all have Family Search accounts, and this looks familiar to you if you don't have one get one it's free and it's just so fun so many things that you can do for it with it so there's the sign in i'm going to sign in the opening page looks like this there's two ways to get into the tree i can get under family tree but also on the right column there's a place of recent people i've looked at who i've recently looked at antonio so i can jump straight to him from recent person if I do it from getting into the tree, then it starts with the starting person, which is most likely me or yourself. And then I would have to drill back through the tree to get to him. So it's easier to jump in right to where he is. So I'll click on that. This is what his uh, profile page looks like. I want to search for the 1940 census. And so I'm going to go over to search records. Now, there is above search records, there is a section called research help. So if, there, if the 1940 census had already been found by Family Search, they would send me a notice under research help as a hint that, hey, here's a census record, maybe you might want to look at. But in this case, there isn't one. So I'm just going to click on Family Search under search records, and the information on Antonio Tarula will already be populated into the search because I am searching from his profile page. This is what it looks like. You can see the information is already populated in on the left. You can see that I have uh, 592 results on this search. They're not all Antonio Tarulo, but these results are, are ranked from most likely to less likely, and so the ones at the bottom have something in common with this information. But I don't, want, I don't want to go through all of these. And what I usually like to do is I like to click on collections. And when I do that, it organizes the file into um, categories. So now you can see that I have the top category is birth, marriage, and death, and the next one is census and lists. And I'm looking through there, I want the 1940 census. I do not see a 1940 census. So what I do see though is show all seven. The default is to show the top five uh, records, and then there'll be a list as to how many more there are in that category. So I'm going to click on that show all seven and hope that the 1940 census shows up and it does. So I click on that and here I have three hits of possibilities for the 1940 census, the one in the middle I know is my family because I know his wife is Lucille. Remember our starting information said he had three children, Anthony, Carol, and Renan. So we know that's him. I have uh, two icons that are have come up, there is one that looks like a piece of paper and one that looks like a camera. The piece of paper represents indexed information. The camera represents a copy of the actual record. So I'm going to click on the indexed information first. This is what comes up on the top toolbar is my information on Anthony, so I can easily compare it with the indexed information. The information on the left is the index information. And as I glance through that, I can see there are my people, Anthony Lucille, Anthony Carol Renard. So this is my family. And then the icon there on the right shows me this is where I can click to see the original document. You always, always, always want to go to the original document. The index information could have been indexed incorrectly, and they never index everything off of the record. So I want to go to the original record so I can get all of the information. So I click on that. This is what it looks like. And the 1940 census is interesting. This is the only census that does this. 
you can see that there's little X's and circles by some people's names, and that is an indication of who the census taker spoke with. So in the case of the Springer family, Molly B is the one who gave the information. In the case of Ida Carr, Ida is the one who gave the information, but there isn't any indication like that as to who gave the information for my Tarula family. So I don't know who did it. I could assume maybe it was Lucille because Anthony and Carol and Renard were too young. Uh, they have a maid there, Ruth uh, Mary. Maybe she did, she's 18. It's possible she could have. So it's hard for me to evaluate how accurate this information is because I don't know who gave it. But what I do know is the family was living in Newport, New Hampshire, in uh, 1940, which is the information I was looking for. Now I want to attach this information to Family Search, so I used the back arrow and went back to the page where I'm looking at the indexed information, and you can see the review and attach button. I'm going to click on that button, and now I have the opportunity to attach the 1940 census this source to my family, to Renard or Anthony. And you'll see that there is a button here that says add. Whenever you see that, add it. So what that means is it's gonna put that information in the individual's uh, profile page and I don't have to type it in later. When I click on that and it came across and that's what it looked like. So it's telling me what it's added is that the, where the family lived in 1935 as well as 1940 because this, the census asked that question. It's the only one that asks, where were you in 35, as well as where were you in 1940? It's a nice question, it lets you track them every five years instead of every 10. And then I'm gonna click attach right down here. I'm gonna do that for every family member, every person that's listed on the census. And uh, once that's done, then you might think that you need to uh, push a, a save button, but you don't because it, the attach and detach are toggle buttons. So all of these records are attached now with the exception of the maid, Ruth Mary, because I don't know who she is. I can't attach that record. And if I wanted to detach it, then I would just click on the detach. So it's a toggle button. I do not have to save it. All I need to do is click on the button, return to family tree. So we use the information and now we need to record the information uh, for our own record. So when you find a document, you need to attach the record to your online tree. In this case, we attached it to FamilySearch and then make a copy of that for your own record. Record it in a research log. If you're using a paper record, record it on your family group sheet. If you're using electronic, record it in your electronic. Uh, records. So when I find a document, this is what I do. I create a Word document and uh, save it in my computer. So at the top in the header, I give my document a name and I give it a code. So my code is TAR for Tarulo, capital A, Anthony Tarulo, number one. And then I write out to rule Anthony 1940 census, Newport Town, Sullivan, New Hampshire. And then the next thing I put is the citation. I always try to include a citation with every document, every source, so I'll know where it came from. Then I cut and paste from that census record. So I pulled out the header, so I'll know what those columns mean, and then I pulled out my people. And below that, I will type out what the census information is. So if this information is hard to read, I only have to go through the brain damage of reading it one time and typing it out. And also when I type it out, it makes me, one, look at every single column and decipher what that information is. And two, it helps me remember what the information is so I get it in my head. Then I, record the information on a research log. Now the biggest mistake that beginner researchers do is they don't use a research log. So please get in the habit of using a research log and uh, it's 
so important on a variety of levels, but probably the most important is if you record where you've been on a research log, then you don't have to go back and redo it and waste time again. And if you, uh, someone asks for information, you can go straight to your research log and see what it is, what you have discovered. So this is a blank research log and I have re included this link to this research log. It's an interactive one. You can move it around the columns and the headings and do use it, make it to fit yours. And I'll show you how I do that for mine. So you can see at the top, I put in the research log for Anthony Tarullo and then I put in the identifying information so I don't have to constantly go back to uh, the program or another family group sheet to find this information. I just put it all in the research log and then I recorded the date I did the research, what I was looking for, where I found it and what it is that I found. And then there's my code from where I have stored the document that has the census record on it. And also and a citation as well on here. Also, you can put in information that to remind you of something else you might want to research. So in this case, I have information about Carol. I, her aunt told me she had been adopted and I want to see if I can find those adoption records or find out any more information about Carol. So I typed that up on the research log and put it in, highlighted in yellow so that I could see it again. There's my reference number to the <clears throat> document. So there you have it. We have done the research process. We identified what we know. We decided what we wanted to learn. We had a research plan to what records we would look for. Then we searched for those records and used the information and now it's time to repeat it. Repeat the process. I hope this helps you. I hope you give it a try and uh, have a good time searching out your relatives. <laughs>